It's a Thursday edition of PFTOT. We are only four days away from the return of PFT Live. And I'm a couple of days away from getting this toupee adjusted. For any of you who think it's a toupee, have you noticed it's grown? I haven't gotten it cut the entire time that we've been off. I thought about not shaving either. I made it about 30 hours before I realized I can't pull it off. I can't not itch like crazy. And it just looks really, really bad. There's a lot more gray on my face than there is in my hair. I guess that's a good thing. All right, here's not a good thing for the New Orleans Saints. Michael Thomas, star receiver, trying to get a new contract and doing the ultimate thing that a player can do to exert leverage on the team with holding services, holding out at the start of New Orleans Saints training camp. There's been indications that progress has been made between the two sides, but they still had a bit of a gap, a couple of million per year. And, of course, structure and guarantees will be part of it. But Michael Thomas has has woefully overperformed. Is that even – does that make sense? He has tremendously overperformed his rookie contract, and it's time for him to get paid. The question is coming up with a number that makes sense. And he'd like to be, reportedly, the first $20 million per year guy. We'll see if he can pull that off. He's drawing that line in the sand and holding out in order to make it happen. A couple of things to keep in mind. First, the standard fine for a training camp holdout is $40,000 per day. Now, a lot of times that money never gets paid. But still, for the guy who's holding out, you are consciously walking into a potential obligation of $40,000 per day. Secondly... The August 6th deadline, we've talked about it as it relates to Ezekiel Elliott. I've talked about it as it relates to Chris Jones, the Chiefs defensive lineman. As it relates to Michael Thomas, he needs to be back by August 6th, or he won't get a year of credit toward free agency, meaning that, assuming he shows up by the Tuesday after week 10, he gets credit for the contract year, but he's still a three-year player when it's time for him to become a free agent next year when his contract expires. That means restricted free agency instead of unrestricted free agency. That means the highest possible RFA tender instead of a franchise tag for Michael Thomas. And then the question becomes, is he comfortable telling the Saints, go ahead, apply the highest RFA tender. Somebody will gladly give up a first-round pick in order to make an offer to me that you may not match. So uh, s- some additional steps that will become clear in the coming days, assuming the Saints don't give Thomas a deal. Maybe they blink. Maybe they get this done. Maybe the holdout spurs action, and Thomas is back in the fold quickly. We'll see how that one plays out. We know how it's playing out for the L.A. Chargers. Melvin Gordon has begun his holdout. Now, because he's in the fifth year of a five-year first-round rookie contract, a couple of things don't apply to him. First of all, the August 6th deadline doesn't matter. He has his four years of credit. He will be an unrestricted free agent after this contract expires. He just needs to show up by the Tuesday after Week 10. Also, the fines are lower for him than they are for other players. By rule... For a player operating under that fifth-year option, it's only $30,000 per day, not $40,000 per day. However, there's another side to it. We learned this last year as it related to Khalil Mack. If you miss a preseason game as a player operating under a fifth-year option contract, your fine for missing that game is the equivalent of your regular season game check. So for Melvin Gordon, $5.605 million that he's due to make this year, divided by 17, that's what he'll be giving up for every preseason game he misses. Basically, he's giving up regular season game checks by missing preseason games. Now, again, would the team pursue that? Who knows? But it's part of the risk that you assume as a player who takes advantage of the power to hold out. And there's going to be people out there who say, oh, he signed a contract. He needs to honor his contract. Look, two contracts apply to NFL players. One, the contract between them and the team. Two, the contract between the league and the NFL Players Association. The player has rights. The player has powers. Now, the player also has obligations under the broader contract. And if the player is willing to assume the risk that the team will indeed collect those fines, the player can withhold services without breaching the broader contract and regardless of anything that may be in his individual contract with his club. Bottom line is the bigger picture for the NFL gives players the right to hold out. It doesn't matter that they have a contract. They can hold out if they're willing to incur the downside. 
for staying away. All right, uh, Yannick Ngakwe, Jaguars defensive end, also has held out. He falls into the Chris Jones, Michael Thomas category, guys entering the fourth year of their contracts, guys who have overperformed slotted rookie weight scale deals, guys who are trying to get that big money before they force their way to the open market or to the franchise tag. And the reason for all of this is you want to shift the injury risk to the team. Because anything can happen in this fourth year. You know, Todd Gurley was in a different kind of a situation last year, but we learned that by Gurley getting his new contract from the Rams, right, he got it then. There's no way the Rams would give it to him now because of what happened last year with his knee. It is important for guys who have established themselves as great players to come up with a way to try to get their contracts before that final year of injury risk that falls on the player comes their way because it could change everything and by next year that player may not be nearly as attractive as he is now falcons receiver julio jones still waiting for his new contract as we've discussed earlier this week plenty of people believe that the falcons already have a contract in place for julio jones it's just a matter of time before they announce it and they have to wait until after friday the 26th of july because that's the one-year anniversary of last year's new contract for julio jones so it's coming we think. And what else is coming, Julio Jones hopes, is a 3,000-yard receiving season. Yes, yes, I, I, I didn't misspeak. I often do. But on that point, 3,000 yards, that's what Julio Jones wants. Now, keep in mind, no one's ever had a 2,000-yard receiving season. Amari Cooper of the Cowboys told me earlier this summer that he's shooting for 2,000. I about fell out of the chair. Julio Jones is taking it a level higher. And I, I understand what guys are doing when they set these ridiculously high goals, they, I think they, they, they're willing to do it because they think it's going to will them to have a bigger year than they would otherwise have if they didn't have an outlandish goal. But this is the time of year where teams and players are just flat out delusional. And Julio Jones can think all he wants, he's got a shot at 3,000 games. That is a ridiculous pace that no one has ever been on. And I, I think there was a time last year where Michael Thomas, based on the first couple of games, was on a ridiculous pace for catches and yards. But it never lasts. Uh, because eventually what's going to happen, if you're having the kind of year it's going to give you 3,000 yards, the opposing defense is going to put five guys on you if they have to to slow you down. So it's fun to talk about, but uh, it's, it's, it's laughable to think that anyone would say 3,000. When no one's ever had 2,000, that's 1,000 yards more than what no one has ever done before in the 99-year history of the league. 3,000 yards. Uh, it's like somebody uh, there's a, there's been a 2000 yard rusher. How ludicrous would it be if somebody said I'm going to rush for 2000 yards this year? Well, that's less ludicrous than what Julio Jones has said. Julian Edelman, the defending Super Bowl MVP, is going to miss some time in training camp. It turns out he has a broken thumb, a broken thumb reportedly suffered while he was playing catch a few weeks ago, which reminds you that, you know, anything can happen at any time. And now Edelman's going to take some time to get ready to go. No indication he'll miss any of the regular season. Remember last year, he missed the first four games due to a PED suspension. This year, he should be ready to roll when the Patriots host the Steelers week one. And... This is going to be a crazy year for the Patriots as it relates to the receiving core because Gronk is gone. It's Julian Edelman and Inkeel Harry, the first-round draft pick, as the top two guys. And who knows how it falls out after that. So they need Edelman there. That, that, that is Tom Brady's safety blanket. And what they need to be doing is developing another safety blanket for Tom Brady because Julian Edelman, who knows how much longer he has, who knows how much longer Brady has, but it just seems like with the Patriots, it all keeps moving in the right direction. It's not moving in the right direction for the Packers and veteran defensive lineman Mike Daniels. Abruptly on Wednesday, the Packers cut the cord on their relationship with Daniels. It surprised a lot of people, as it turns out, and th this was explained yesterday by Packers GM Brian Gutekunst, they tried to trade him, and they couldn't. There were multiple teams reportedly interested. Now, why wouldn't they be able to trade him? Well, he was due to make over $7.5 million in salary this year. The Packers thought he's not worthy of it based on where he is in this career at this point. And no other team was willing to throw a seventh-round pick, a sixth-round pick, a fifth-round pick Green Bay's way to buy his contract. You know, a lot of times when a trade happens of a veteran player, the trade gets done because you like that contract, because you know if the guy gets cut, it's going to cost you a lot more on the open market to get him. So now the question becomes, what will someone pay Mike Daniels on the open market, and can his agent create enough competition 
among multiple teams to drive that number up. And I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the day there's kind of a face-saving contract where he can earn up to the money he was due to make in Green Bay through incentives, escalators, et cetera. But if anyone was going to pay him what he was due to make with the Packers this year, they likely would have given the Packers something. And the Packers wouldn't have taken anything. They get no compensation for cutting Mike Daniels. This isn't like a normal free agent deal where the guy's contract expires, he signs with a new team, and you get a compensatory draft pick. You get nothing when you cut a guy. So the Packers would have taken anything, and no one was willing to offer anything to get his contract. That tells me wherever he lands, he's going to be making less than he was due to make with the Green Bay Packers. And that's it for Thursday's PFTOT. We'll have one more tomorrow, and then Monday we are back. Sims will be back. I'll still be here, but we'll be on NBC Sports Radio and NBCSN starting Monday, July the 29th, and continuing indefinitely or until they pull us off the air. We will be online around the clock at profootballtalk.com. We'll see you there. We'll see you here. We'll see you everywhere. But at a minimum, we'll see you back here again tomorrow.